If you're looking to freshen up your hairstyle before Valentine's Day, but don't have time to make it to the salon or wait for the next available appointment, never fear. Madison Reed offers salon-quality hair color from the convenience of your home at a fraction of the price. With premium ingredients and expert assistance, Madison Reed has everything you need to color your hair at home with confidence. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit when you use the code GRAMMARGIRL. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have a quick and dirty tip about towing the line. Another quick and dirty tip about the difference between pled and pleaded and a meaty middle about international animal idioms. That's a hard thing to say. (laughs) Let's start with the quick and dirty tips. Lately, it seems as if politicians are constantly calculating whether they should tow the party line or not. But is that tow the line, T-O-E, or tow the line, T-O-W? You can imagine logical reasons for it to be either one, But the right choice is toe the line like the toes on your footsies. One of the first examples in the Oxford English Dictionary is from an 1834 book called Peter Simple, written by the naval officer and novelist Frederick Marriott. The line reads, He desired us to toe a line, which means to stand in a row. Toe the line is actually part of a group of phrases that all have people towing something. Earlier than towing the line, you could tow the mark or tow the trig, a line marked on the ground. And later you could tow the scratch, again a kind of mark. The general idea is of people lining up in a row in the same place, at least sometimes to start a race or a contest. You can imagine how people lining up in a row with their toes on a line would lead to the idea of people falling in line as in conforming to a political agenda or behaving the way superiors want them to behave. So your quick and dirty tip is that when you're writing about people towing the line, think of them standing with their T-O-E toes on a real line on the ground, and then you'll get the spelling right. And now, since that was short, I have another quick and dirty tip for you. What is the past tense of the verb to plead? Should we say that Squiggly pled guilty or Squiggly pleaded guilty? Think about it for a second. Most sources say that the correct past tense is pleaded. Squiggly pleaded guilty. That dirty, rotten scoundrel. Garner's Modern American Usage, the AP Style Book, and the Chicago Manual of Style all say to use pleaded. You should also use pleaded as the participle, as in, squiggly has pleaded guilty. Some people do prefer pled, but the AP style book calls it a colloquial past tense form. Nevertheless, most lawyers use pleaded. For example, in a 2013 ABA journal post, a senior litigation associate named Brian Boone reported doing a West law search and finding that, quote, the U.S. Supreme Court has used pleaded in more than 3,000 opinions and pled in only 26, unquote. Your quick and dirty tip is to stay out of trouble so you never have to make a choice. But if you must, tell people you pleaded innocent or guilty. Before we get to the meaty middle, it's time to thank our second sponsor this week, Blue Apron. Not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients make a real difference, so it's important to know where your food comes from. Thankfully, for less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers easy-to-follow recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients courtesy of more than 150 local farms, ranches, and fisheries across the United States, right to your door. And because Blue Apron ships the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, there's no food waste. I love that. It's everything you need to make sustainable and delicious home-cooked meals in 40 minutes or less. Some of the meals available in February include cashew chicken stir-fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice, Udon noodle soup with miso and soft-boiled eggs, 
Roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad, and crispy barramundi with quinoa and roasted carrot salad. Yum. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash grammar. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash grammar. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And now on to international animal idioms. Phrases, idioms, proverbs, and sayings can be the hardest thing for non-native speakers to learn, because most of the time you can't translate the words literally. What could a French person mean when saying, there's an eel under the rock? I don't know. This episode focuses on a few interesting rodent and cattle-related phrases in English and in other cultures. Each culture has its own opinions about certain animals, and this is often reflected in its language. Take rodents, for example. In English, there are multiple expressions that are not too kind to rats. A young lady can have ratty hair. Her hair is messy and tangled. Someone's house can look like a rat's nest. His living area is in disorder. If you smell a rat, you are suspicious of a situation. If you are a rat, you're a snitch. Other languages use the word rat in similar ways. In Spanish, for example, una rata can mean a cheapskate or a bad person. There's a Chinese proverb with the head of a buck and the eyes of a rat that means unattractive or unappealing. The French have a saying that translates to bored as a dead rat. (laughs) That must be pretty bored. Many rodents are used in medical experiments. If you're a lab rat, you're a test subject. You can also call someone a guinea pig which means the same thing but uses a different rodent. This expression was first recorded in 1920. Other expressions point out differing qualities that rodents might have, including industriousness and playfulness. For example, the Armenian expression, the mouse couldn't fit through the hole and then it tied a broom to its tail, refers to people who take on more responsibilities than they can handle. You've likely heard the expression, while the cat's away, the mice will play. Well, there's a similar expression in German, and in the Dutch version of this saying, the mice are dancing. Another English expression, on the other hand, suggests that mice might not be having such a good time, as poor as a church mouse. According to the book Heavens to Betsy and Other Curious Sayings, the expression goes back to the 17th century in England and likely originates from a similar French idiom. Perhaps there was once a mouse that didn't find anything to eat in a church, which has no pantry. A similar expression also appears in German. But rodents aren't considered unpleasant in some cultures. For example, the rat comes first in the Chinese zodiac. People born in the year of the rat, which comes once every 12 years, are considered quick-witted, resourceful, versatile, kind, smart, and lovely. In India, there's even a temple, the Karnimata Temple, where rats run free, are worshipped, and share food and milk with visitors. One more thing about rodents before we move on to cattle, and then to the answer about the eel. For centuries, rats have been blamed for being involved in transmitting the deadly bubonic plague, which has killed millions of people. According to an article in the Washington Post, Gerbils, another kind of rodent, may be to blame rather than rats. If gerbils turn out to be the culprits, maybe in the future we'll encounter an idiom or two featuring those animals, but there don't seem to be any interesting ones at the moment. Now, on to cattle. Cattle feature in some interesting idioms. The expression, like a bull in a china shop, describes someone who goes headfirst into a delicate situation, or someone who's very clumsy. According to the Free Dictionary, this idiom was first recorded in an 1834 novel called Jacob Faithful. The site explains that the expression also appears in several European languages, but instead of a bull, the animal is an elephant. Either large mammal would probably make a big mess if you took this phrase literally. You might have heard the phrase a cock and bull story to describe nonsense. 
One can imagine what kind of story would result from a conversation between those two different animals. The French have a similar phrase, although this imaginary conversation takes place between a rooster and a donkey. The last cattle-related idiom we'll discuss today is holy cow, which you can say when you're surprised. This expression dates from around 1920. Other words used before cow were mackerel, about 1800, and Moses, used since around 1850. There's even an expression, holy crickets! The phrase holy cow is likely to come from the sacredness of cows in India. You've already heard that some people in India revere rats. Cows, however, are more widely known to be sacred in India, where, according to a BBC article, cows amble unmolested in the streets. Before we go, here's the answer to what the French mean when they say, there's an eel under the rock. If you guessed it's related to rats or cattle, the main animals we talked about today, holy cow, you are right. Well, at least peripherally. The French are saying that they smell a rat, that something fishy is going on. It's possible that eels smell as bad as rats. Either way, don't sniff too closely. And sorry we made you wait until the cows came home a long time to get the answer. That segment was written by Bonnie Mills, author of The Curious Case of the Misplaced Modifier, who blogs at sentencesleuth.blogspot.com. Finally, this week I have some shout-outs to Mohanad, who listens while driving to and from work in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Missy, who listens while driving her Tesla in Sydney, Australia. Joaquin, who listens on his way to work in Valladolid, Spain. Al Karin, who listens with her daughter on the way to drama class in Dublin, Ireland. Fatima, who listens in Tehran, Iran. And Jason, who listens in the car going back and forth to work in events. And Connie, who listens at her desk at work. If you want to tell me where you listen, use the hashtag WhereIListen on Twitter or Instagram. And it helps me see it faster if you tag me, too. I love to hear from you, and I especially love seeing your pictures. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find transcripts of this podcast and all my other articles at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. 